Warren Stewart country. How many of y'all remember Warren when he used to preach here? When he was a student at Union Theological Seminary before he got called to Phoenix, Arizona, where he is now president of the Arizona Baptist Church. But she is from, initially from that hot climate. It's hot in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, yeah, they're in a big war there trying to keep that wall from coming up. Amen. And she is served, and you see her training in sociology. And uh, she is a Michelle Obama uh, graduated from, from Princeton. Yes, they might have been in the same class. You never know who you in school with, do you? Never know who you're in school with, right? <laughs> amen, amen. So she is uh, also has a doctorate from McCormick Theological in Chicago. And uh, did you look follow right down the line, don't uh, managed for many years, senior partner, consulting group, a global religious Global Director of Director at a local foundation, Senior Advisor to the President of the Church World Service that take care of all them hurricanes and storms that go through Puerto Rico and all throughout the islands. And then the Director of, of our Community Transformation, I can go on, Director of African American Studies at Brad. Amen. Executive Director of Peoria Friendship House and a member of the Madison Avenue Baptist Church. Past President of the Baptist Peace Fellowship of North America and Chair of Inspiration Action USA. Amen. A startup humanitarian organization. A project. Well, I'll take it right now where she stands up, she says a whole lot. And it's good to read it and then to pray. Amen. Amen. And so without further ado, she will come directly following it. But we're grateful to have the executive director of the ministry of the American Baptist Church that covers all Baptists from New York, Metro New York, and Long Island. She is the voice for Baptists in the, in the city and the region of the eastern region of the United States of America. None other than the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Dutton, put your hand together and welcome her. To Dr. Scott, a beloved brother in Christ, who has served faithfully in New York City in the Harlem mm. uh, Village for many years, and whose reputation and renown is known throughout <laughs> all of the world. <laughs> and your reputation precedes you. I thank God for you, and I thank God for this opportunity to, to speak at your church. Amen. Thank you. Thank God. Sometimes those who live very close are the first, the last one to get to church. I just live a few blocks away on 155th Street, and as I was, as I was walking to church today, um, it's good to, as you know, in New York City to get on another block because you see things um, that have been there obviously, but your eyes have not been held. And so it's good to be here on 152nd Street between Amsterdam and Frederick Douglass Boulevard at a church called St. John's. I thank God for this opportunity as I looked and saw my brother, um, Jerry McCants at the organ. Um, if you do not know, you need to know that um, right. Brother McCants right. has been an integral part of the American Baptist Churches in Metropolitan New York Amen. for many decades, I think. <laughs> and I've been um, with American Baptist Churches in Metropolitan New York since 2015. And in that short period of time, I've come to rely on his consistent, faithful presence Amen. among us and within us. 
Um, he has served, as he has told me, with three regional ministers. Um, first with Carl Flemister and right. then with um, Reverend James Stallings and then with myself. And so I've been honored and we have been honored, uh, Brother McCants, uh, that you have Amen. not felt it robbery. Right. To every once in a while, come and be with us and the extended family that we call American Baptist Churches of Metropolitan New York. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott, for reading every word. <laughs> every letter of my bio that is in your bulletin. As I was being taken care of before service today by Minister Sharon, and she's confessed that um, Dr. Scott loves to be proud of people and to uh, laud them. And so I'm grateful to God for that. And so what all of us hope is that when all is said and done, that uh, we um, bear witness to the Christ that called us. Amen. And that each of us uh, will be recognized as a child of God. Amen. And so I'm glad to be here on your 101st anniversary. And I, and I join you in celebration. For God truly is good. The first 100 years and then the next 100 years to come. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. I will come to you in my own way this morning. Thanking God for the word that... I've been led to, and as Pastor Scott, when he invited me, told me that the uh, theme would be increase. I've been praying and meditating on that theme and saying, what is it that God, that you would have me say uh, to this historic yet enduring church on uh, this 101st anniversary? And so, I believe God led me to um, a passage in the Old Testament um, to add to the scriptures that have already been read this morning. Let us turn to 1 Kings, the 17th chapter. And I will read, and having taken... Uh, Reverend Scott's Bible from the Little Stand. I will read from his Bible, the New Revised, the New King James Version, um, which captures a beautiful story about Elijah, the prophet of, of Elijah, and a widow. And so the words, beginning with eighth, the eighth verse through the sixteenth verse of First Kings. 17 reads as follows. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there mm. gathering sticks. Mm. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup mm. that I may drink. Mm. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, And please, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And so she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare for myself and my son, that we may eat it. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me. 
And afterwards, make some for yourself and for your son. Mm. For thus saith the Lord of God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, mm. nor shall the jar of oil run dry. Until that day, the Lord sends rain on the earth. <clears throat> so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. <clears throat> the bin of flour was not used up, <clears throat> nor did the jar of oil run dry. <clears throat> according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Won't you join me in prayer? We thank you, God, for this holy hour. We thank you for these moments that you have provided for us to eat deeply from your word, and so we pray that you would speak even now through your servant, mm. that your people might feast heartily, and that your servant even might eat heartily too. For we want to hear from you, and so we pray that you would reveal yourselves mm. to your people. Yes. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 I want you to consider with me the topic. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. I think you would agree with me this morning that there's a lot going on in this old world of ours. We just ended the longest government shutdown of 35 days, where 800,000 government employees were without pay, and many had to show up and not get paid. We know that the president will continue his arm wrestling, if you will, with the Speaker of the House and the Congress for at least three more weeks. There's a lot going on in our world. Amen. Persons in desperate situations continue to look for refuge in our country, a country where many of us were dragged here in chains, but yet, nevertheless, it's our country. And one strong response, as we know, is that we need a wall <laughs> to keep some out. <laughs> Women have declared Enough is enough right. to sexual harassment and Thank intimidation. Thank God. Gun and violence of other kinds remain at alarming levels. <coughs> and we say, when will enough be enough? Right. One more life has been taken. <coughs> As Pastor Scott knows in his work, Affordable housing in New York City is becoming more and more non-existent. Will some of us have a place to live? We worry about travel, too. And we see that metro cars are likely to go up. And we turn on the news in the morning, if your habit is like mine, to see what else has happened <laughs> while we were sleeping. We wonder when enough will be enough. And we find that black lives don't seem to matter, brown lives either. Many times in life, we get to the point where we say, when will enough be enough. Right, right. We know that there are many things that in this whole world that cause us great concern, and if we are vigilant, if we are wise in our faith, we don't just look to the symptoms of what is happening in the world, but we, we get down on our knees. Right. 
We don't give up. We say, God, we need you to intervene. And this is the takeaway if you don't hear anything else from this sermon today. We are called as people of God to see our lives with the lenses, with the eyes of faith. And to see in part, at least in part, what God sees. The whole picture. The larger picture. And how God, through that larger picture, when things seem hopeless, when we are saying enough is enough, God still provides for us through it. In that old story, which is one of my favorites that I read just a few moments ago, we see a little meal, if you will, between a prophet and a widow. Verse 14 says, For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be empty, and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. And so she went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as he and her household ate for many days. Yeah. And the jar of meal was not empty. Mm. Neither did the jug of oil fail, yeah. according to the word of the Lord that he spoke mm. by Elijah. Mm. Journey with me, <laughs> sisters and brothers, through this beautiful story of faith this morning, yeah. where we wonder, mm. will there be enough? Mm. So I need you to help me this morning. Yes. Yes. I want this side to say, there is enough. There is enough. And you all say, there isn't enough. There is 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 enough. Okay, you've got your parts. <laughs> and so looking at the story of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath, we know that in part, just by understanding the story that it's a hard life for a widow. As a surviving spouse, and we're not sure how long she had been a widow, she had to, to realign her life. And so we know from the portions that remained in her pantry, she was using little by little what she had in order to survive. And she had to figure it out without her partner in life. To tend to the day-to-day -day responsibilities of her life, of her household, of her son that we know about, and to learn how to breathe and to move without her husband. If any have lost a spouse, they know that one's life completely changes when they are no longer with you. Yeah. And through the, through the days of grief and sometimes years of grief, grief, grief. you wonder how you will, you're going to make it yeah. through the rest of your life. Right. Right. And in this period of the Old Testament where this story is found, mm -hmm. as is still true in, in many places of the world, mm -hmm. a widow isn't simply a woman who has lost her husband. But a widow suddenly finds herself in a un, very unfriendly place. Right. People look at her as a burden. Mm. Among those who are trying to, to pull some things together for themselves and wonder how long it will, it will be before her demise mm. comes. And because of the state of the widow, that's why there are so many passages in the Bible where God is urging us to be kind to widows and to right. make sure right. that widows and children right. are not overlooked. Right. The word widow is not used loosely mm -hmm. 
in this passage. Mm. For this woman wasn't simply a woman who had lost her, her husband and wasn't simply a poor, piteous soul who found herself without the generous support of a benefactor like another family member who would take her in. But she was nearly at her last rope. We thank God that some things have changed for some widows. Yeah. And some women in many places of the world, but for many still, as was true in Zarephath, the condition of the, of the widow is dire. Mm -hmm. And so you have a widow. And we have an understanding of what widows go through. Yeah. But God <laughs> told Elijah. Go ahead. That he was to go to the next town. Yeah. And when he got there, he was to look, look. for a particular woman. <laughs> Not just a woman, but to look for a widow. The prophet Elijah knew ah. in finding a widow, he ah. would suddenly be looking at someone ah. who was struggling with the basics of life and struggling to keep alive. Mm, mm, mm. In Zarephath, mm. at the time of this story, this woman who had been suddenly widowed found herself living a life that she had not intended. Mm, mm. I believe that as a younger woman, she had agreed to marry a, a wealthy, secure man, uh. a man who was a landowner, some of us would be so blessed to get such a man ourselves. <laughs> a man who had property and a house. And together they would create it and grow a family. Yeah. It was a wonderful vision. And so when marrying him, she knew that she had a husband mm. who, know, who knew how to use his, his land wisely. Oh. A man who knew how to farm who knew how to plant grain and to cultivate it and, and to grow it plenteously. She believed that when she decided and with the agreement of her family to marry him, that she had the promise mm. of security mm. for a lifetime. Mm. I believe that her husband gladly contributed to the security of her parents he generously paid the bridal price. Yeah. And I believe that her parents believed that in giving their daughter's hand in marriage to him, mm. they were ensuring her future. Her parents were assured that their daughter would have enough. And they said, there is enough. Yeah. The years that they did have to spend together, I believe, were happy. She became pregnant easily and, and had a son, and, and she felt and knew that she had been blessed by God with a son. Mm, mm, mm. And so they were so happy, mm. happy together as a family. And then the unthinkable happened. Unthinkable. Mm. The husband that she had been given died. died. Although he was older, she had never imagined that he, he would die. How could this happen, she prayed to God. She lamented day and night in her prayers. Why did you take him from me? What am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? She found that she had no one to turn to. Her parents had gotten older and they were no longer an option. Mm. And any remaining family that she had on their side were hard to find. Mm. She found herself alone mm. with her young son. Right. And she feared there isn't enough. Mm. When 
the husband was alive and when the farm was producing food, they always made sure that they put food into the storehouse after the harvest. And she felt that they had a little, she believed that they had a little to survive on, to thrive on even, but little by little, the storehouse was used up. The dried meat and the fruit in the storehouse were eaten. And she only had at the end, at the beginning of the story, just a bit of grain <laughs> in a jar and a little oil in a jug. When famine had hit the land, it got even worse. Everything dried up and everyone was in the same situation, scrounging for themselves. The local food pantries were dried up. Yeah. Neighbors didn't have anything to share, didn't have anything to say, but sister, I'll pray for you. <laughs> there isn't enough <laughs> for us to share with you. And so she prayed. She remembered the God of her household and said, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm a woman without a husband and with a young son. Hear my voice and have her mercy on, on me. And we're told that finally the Spirit of God spoke to her in her dreams, saying, I'm going to send you a message. And she waited for that messenger to come. It's a hard life yeah. for a widow. Amen. But it's also, Pastor Scott, a, a hard life being a prophet. We heard the gospel passage earlier when Jesus was asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? And Elijah was mentioned, and we know that Elijah lived a blameless life. Mm. So much so that no other character in the Bible mm. really has his spot. Right, right. But it's still a hard life. Right, right. For a prophet. Right. Elijah was God's prophet, and so as his prophet, he was constantly being uprooted. He was sent from place wow. to place. At the direction of the Lord, he couldn't take make roots anywhere, nor could he create a home for his himself. He, he didn't have a, a normal life. He had many hardships. He was lonely, I believe. He was thirsty a lot of the times, and he was physically hungry much of the time, relying on the gifts of others. He wasn't getting paid for his ministry. <laughs> Nobody was paying him to go from pillar to post, bringing an often unwanted message from God. Nobody's going to pay you for that. No. And Elijah had been hungry often in his prophet's life. I'm sure that when he was not hungry, he wanted to scrounge up the food knowing that he would surely be hungry again as he was faithful in performing the task of, God, of being God's prophet. He had been led earlier into the wilderness where he was, as we are told, dependent on the ravens for food. And God through the ravens sent him bread by day and meat at night. It's a hard life. <laughs> Being a prophet, even one who has dedicated themselves to, to living out the call of God, we don't know often where our next mouthful is coming. Right, right, right. Sometimes our dreams betray us. <laughs> and we wonder are, are you going to provide, oh Lord? Prophets themselves, they don't have blueprints Preach. or crystal balls, Preach. if you will. They, we can't always Preach. anticipate what the Preach. next assignment will be Preach. or when the next blessing will come. Preach. And it 
what? Reform. In this life of faith has some uncertainties. Right. But we do have some assurances yeah. in the midst of these uncertainties that God will continue to be faithful and will surprise us yeah. by coming to us yeah. in different forms. Yeah. Elijah is a fascinating person in the Bible. We are told that once when he was looking for water, he found a spring and he lingered there and drank deeply. Mm. And he drank until it dried up the spring. <laughs> and when it had dried up, he wandered to the next place that God told him to go. And so we are at the spring where the story picks up where he was told to go to Zarephath. Zarephath, he said, I don't know about that place. <laughs> Are they friendly there? <laughs> Are they hostile to outsiders? Are they building walls to keep me out? Lord have mercy. <laughs> Yet he was told to, to go there, to Zarephath, a place he did not know, and to look for a widow. <laughs> a widow of all people. And that widow had been alerted that someone would be coming. And that widow, who had very little, was also directed by the word of the Spirit to feed him. She must have wondered, there isn't enough. I think Elijah, knowing the plight of a widow and knowing the plight of a prophet, must have thought, I'm going to get help from a widow? Oh. <laughs> of all people? She's worse off than me. <laughs> what does it profit a prophet to ask for food for someone who has less than I have. He must have thought, God, that doesn't make any sense. How can I make myself ask her? But he remembered that the ravens had fed him earlier. And that didn't make sense. Thank you. And so he went on to Zarephath. And he looked for that widow. When he got there, he found her. If he were me, <laughs> I think he would have eased himself into the big eyes. <laughs> Asking her first for a little fresh water <laughs> in order to quench his parched throat. <laughs> so she gave him a little water. <laughs> I think he looked around. <laughs> he sized her up and saw for himself, sure enough. <laughs> she had so little. She was a slight woman, thin, from lack of nourishment. And he saw the little child that was her son. A young child that couldn't fend for himself. He saw her circumstances. Yet he mustered up the nerve and the strength and the faith to ask her directly for something. A morsel of bread. Something to eat. I don't know about you, Pastor, but it's hard to ask. <laughs> for something, help from people that you know they don't have much. You suspect they may not have a whole lot of extra to give. We look at them and think, how can I ask? How can I have the nerve to ask? There simply isn't enough. But at the direction of the Lord, we ask anyway. We get up the gumption and we ask. And the woman had been warned that 
someone was coming and that someone who was coming would be hungry and she naturally resisted feeding him. Maybe she had a little bit of sass left in her and she looked at him plainly and said, look, I only have a handful of meal. I only have a few drops of oil. I was going to take that little bit, make a plain cake for my, me and my son to eat. That would be it. After we eat it, we will wait to die because that would be it. Mm. We have no more. Mm. Her expression must have been, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Now I believe in those moments of obedience, Elijah in his gumption and nerve at asking someone with so little for something, he was getting his training or his anointing furthered as a prophet. God was strengthening him to go into the impossible Mm. and to wait for the impossible mm. to yeah. unfold. Yeah. Yeah. God sometimes sends us into strange places yeah. and it's very dire yeah. to ask for the impossible. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and as we are waiting for the anointing to fall, we yes. see the Bring impossible it. happen. Yes. 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 This is a beautiful story about how God makes a prophet. Yes. It's a beautiful story about how God makes a disciple. Yes. 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 I think the widow and the prophet needed each other in that moment. Yes. So that each would know who they were. Yes. <laughs> 